Kate, thank you for joining us on the briefing today. First things first, how did you get started in the sex work industry? Basically, I uh, dropped out of university and was doing a teaching degree and I was waitressing um, and I met some sex workers and I was impressed. Well, I found them impressive as people. And um, yeah, so that's how, and then I thought I'll give it a go. And so, what sort of work were you doing to start with? Sex work. I was working privately in the city of Sydney um, in a unit. Um, there weren't mobile phones then, so I, was, I had a landline and I'd sit in there for hours, um, generally in the daytime. Um, I had a unit that another woman that I met had left. She'd retired, so I took over her unit and I was in the city of Sydney um, working off a, a landline. So was that how you accessed clients was through a tele- like a landline yes, yes, telephone? Yes. So how would they find you? How would they discover you for your services? Um, basically um, referrals because this, this particular phone number had been used for a long time by sex workers. So people that already had the number um, So word, and word of mouth. So uh, before we started today, you um, corrected me. So we say brothels mm-hmm. colloquially, but there's actually the term sex services premises. Mrs. Is that right? So I'll use that terminology. When did you start working in sex service premises? Um, when I was 24. Um, I started in the industry when I was 21, 2021, work, working privately and you know, having an exciting time running around doing other things as well as sex work. And then I met a woman from, um, who used, can I mention the name of the place? Of course. Uh, who used to work at a touch of class back then. And it was very busy and she said, oh, it's so busy. And, and, um, you know, I'm making lots of money and it's great. And, and I thought, oh, that sounds good. So, um, I went in and, um, went there and applied to work at a touch of class in Surrey Hills. Mm-hmm. And th- how how then did your career progress from that point when you started working in an actual premises? Well, I found it actually really empowering because you go in, you spend, you spend your time and then you leave and that's it. You're not waiting for the phone to call. I found it busier. I like the company of the other women, which I, I found um, like good company. I felt safe. I actually found it um, very empowering working working there. So how long did that go on before you started running your own premises? Um, I worked there and then it briefly got shut down for a while and then I worked in another place. So basically for six years and then um, I bought premises and I renovated it. So I worked for six years in establishments, in two establishments. And I saved my money and then I started my own place. Mm. And what was that like getting that off the ground? Hard. Mm. Very hard, very hard. Um, yeah, the local thug, I went to meet them and introduce myself and say, I'd be opening up my business. And I was told that I wouldn't be and that, that, that he said to me, I won't say his name, but he's no longer with us, but he said, oh no, you won't. That's my street. You won't be opening up a business there. And so, um, I got kind of scared, but anyway, as luck would have it when the time came to open my business, um, he had legal problems of his own and he didn't have the time to bother with getting rid of, you know, stopping me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, it was hard. And then I got taken to court by the council, Sydney City Council, um, because back then it was not a legal use. And so they took me to court. Then I established um, that there'd been um, prostitution on the premises for a number of years previously, established existing use right. But it was really hard. It was very hard starting a business back then, mm. it was a, especially if you didn't have, you're doing it yourself. Mm. And so from that point, you have been running your own premises. Yes. Do you still work as well? No. No, you just no. run the premises. No. Tell me about then how it would work with a premises pre-internet. You've explained how there was a landline service that was kind of a referral thing. Yeah. You've got your own business now and I'm speaking pre-internet days. Sure. How did you get the word out there? So basically, again, word of mouth is the best form of referral. Uh, Then there'd be um, advertising in the Telegraph and also your local papers. But technically it was illegal to advertise in. They were just choosing not to prosecute us. 
but it was against the law mm-hmm. to advertise in the Telegraph and in the local paper stand. But essentially that was, that was the three forms, referrals, um, Telegraph, local papers. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was it. So when I was in school, uh, and I'm talking primary school, we would pick out the local Mm. brothels, as we called Mm. them then, sex work premises, uh, because they had the big numbers out the front. Mm. It was all blacked out curtains and Mm -hmm. it had the flashing lights Mm -hmm. and it'd say open, but Mm -hmm. that's it. That's all you'd get. Was that kind of a form of advertising as well? Would you get people who would walk down the street and recognize, oh, that's somewhere I can go meet a sex worker? There were places like that, but we weren't. We didn't have red lights. We didn't, we wanted to be low key because a lot of our clients were well known. Um, and that's why we always had to make sure we had a back entrance. So we didn't have red lights. We wanted to be unobtrusive. So we had a terrace house in Potts Point and, um, it, no, we didn't, but there were, there were places like with flashing red lights and, but our clients didn't want to be noticed. Mm. They wanted, they wanted to get in and get out discreetly. A lot of them came in the back way. They didn't want it. And you had private waiting rooms. The idea was that they they didn't want to be noticed. They want, wanted anonymity and that was very important to them. Okay. So let's talk then about technology and specifically the internet, which you have worked, you have run your business pre and post internet. We've talked about the pre, pretty rudimentary in terms of advertising, relying a lot on word of mouth. How have you seen the industry specifically sex services premises, change since the internet came in? Well, radical change with the internet because it it means that plus accompanying the internet is the mobile phones. So the two go together. So pretty much it you um, for premises, um, the website, you can promote yourself. You can have a lot of photographs. You can have ladies can put their photos without faces on you know, so it's been made an, a, like a radical um, change to the industry, like rat, and, and mobile phones even more so. So women can work privately more easily. They've got a lot more autonomy. You don't need to work in a place anymore. Whereas formerly, if you were private, you were generally like, I'm generalizing a street worker. Mm. Um, there were like a middle rung or there was the houses. So then it, it gave a lot more independence to women um, which was, which, which I didn't have an issue with. I think it's fine. And to the places, it means that a lot more people could find out about you by Googling you. So, um, it, it, I think it's, it's been very empowering as long as, um, people aren't underage that are, you know, like, so, so for instance, we've got ladies that work in our premises. They're not, obviously they're choosing to work there. They're not underage. They're not being compelled by anyone. That That's really important that people are choosing freely to work in this industry. So I think it's been really empowering. The internet's just been like, so, you know, we get like people from all around Australia, make it like ladies, um, clients. It's been, um, I think it's been very good for the industry. And and, okay, and there's a lot more competition, Mm. but then that goes with it. Do you feel like there's less of a stigma associated with sex work in part because of the internet. I know for my generation, so I'm a millennial, um, you know, I'm exposed to people who use things like OnlyFans, people who have sold pictures of themselves online. To me, it's just another job. I don't view it as anything good or bad or otherwise. It's a profession. However, you look back even 20, 30 years, it was very different. And I feel like the internet has played a role in legitimizing sex work. Uh, would you agree that there is less of a stigma around it now? Absolutely. And because there's so many different options and, and with OnlyFans and all the different options that people have, and it's also, it's publicized more. So I, I, I agree that, that it, there definitely is less of a stigma. However, when you're dealing with people like banks, they do discriminate um, against people in our industry. And if few of the major banks actually, if they know you're in that industry, they actually just um, won't, you know, will stop. They'll, they'll withdraw their, ser- like their FPOS services, etc. So generally in society, yes, less, less stigma. But um, when it comes to banks or I'd say um, schools, um, it's not a, probably a selling point. What do you mean by schools? Do you mean like if you're a parent sending your kids to a school and they know what you do for work? Yeah. 
Really? Absolutely. Have you experienced that? Yes. In what way? Well, it's like if someone wants to hurt you, they don't hurt you, they hurt your, your children mm. because they spread, spread rumours. of It's happened to me, you know, send an email to the other parents about you, or you and your background. Wow. Yeah. So it's, but I mean, again, you just soldier on, you just ignore it and you, and then you find the parents sympathize with the child rather than with the, because they do it anonymously. But yeah, it's, it's discriminations there, but it's just a little bit more subtle. Mm. It's like was previously it was, but yeah, dealing with banks, um, people like that, it's, a, or even for instance, insurance companies, they penalize us, the insurance we've had in our buildings. Like I've got a concrete building with fire escapes and it's really safe, but our insurance is through the roof. We've never made an insurance claim. So again, it's, you're discriminated against. So, but then you just go, well, that goes with the territory. You can't, no point whining. You just got to work around it. Do you think that'll continue to change? I mean, OnlyFans, and I use OnlyFans as the reference because I feel like that is the one that has cracked into the mainstream so much in terms of, uh, you know, there are so many OnlyFans creators on TikTok. Um, it's talked about in the news. It's talked about in papers. We're talking about it right now on a mm -hmm. podcast. Uh, do you expect then that the stigma around it that does still exist is going to continue to ease as time goes yes. on, given the internet's, yes. you know, pushing it out to more people? Yes, because of the the fact that it's in the media more and all sorts of aspects of the industry. And, and, and also because it shows role, mo role models of women and men that are intelligent, that have a lot of options, whereas traditionally the cliche was, oh, this person can't, is stupid, they can't do anything else or they're desperate, or they're on drugs. You see women and men that are smart, empowered, that have a lot of options, that are choosing to go into this industry. You know, they might be a law student, they might be a graduate. I mean, we've ladies that work in our premises, a few of them have degrees. You know, there are other things that they can be doing, but they choose to work in this industry because of the flexibility, the financial returns. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Before I let you go, um, how many of the women who work on your premises are supplementing the work they're doing in person with internet work as well? Is it kind of a, a existing sex workers using online sex work as a side hustle? The women that I know, but but um, personally that are working in premises or in, don't tend to do internet because they can make more money um, from in person, um, from working in person. But then they're not, I have heard of a woman in the Blue Mountains and she solely focuses on the internet and she makes a very healthy income. So I'd say if you specialised and you really went out of your way and you kept changing your content, then yes, but the women I know tend to focus because they want to, want to work and they want to leave and they don't want the hassle. Because the thing with that is you're online, you you're when the client wants you. Yeah, you're constantly so available. You're constantly available with the advantage of working you know, you choose when you're going to work and then when you leave, you leave. So the women I know, know, but that doesn't mean it's not happening, mm. but not in a great degree to my knowledge. Mm. So I guess an overarching question then to end, has the internet been good or bad for sex work? Good. I think it's like, I think it's been good and it's um, enlightened a lot of people. It's given the women a lot of choices, the establishment owners choices. So I think it's been good. So long as there are rules, re children animals, as long as there's, there's, there's criteria of what's not acceptable. Mm. Well, Kate, thank you for sharing you. your story with me. Thank I you. do appreciate it. It's something that I think people are inherently interested in that they don't understand yeah. much about. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Great. Thank you. That was great.